Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. This is The Takeout. We are in the Longworth House office building <laughs> because we're interviewing Jasmine Crockett, freshman <laughs> member of the Democratic House, Texas District 30, which is yeah. the Dallas area, Love Field and Tarrant County. Congresswoman, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you, too. Glad that you could come to the freshman dorm. Yes. <laughs> um, and see what it's like to be a freshman and be in small quarters. But yes, absolutely welcome. Earlier this week, we are recording this on May 8th, Hakeem Jeffries, the leader of the House Democrats, told my colleague Nora O'Donnell on 60 Minutes that effectively <laughs> Democrats run the House of Representatives. <laughs> As a member of the House Democratic Caucus, do you feel like you remember the majority party, not in number, but in actuality? Oh, absolutely. Um, you usually expect for the majority to be the ones that set the legislative agenda and to get things done. Anything that's been important that has been passed for the American people has only happened because of Democrats. Now, I will say um, that that far right faction, that MAGA faction, has actually empowered the Democrats. I mean, you would think that they would learn at this point, right? But it is a bad day when your speaker says, you know what? I can't get through to y'all. No matter what I do, it would be easier to just deal with the opposite party. And that's what we found, which means that if you want us to supply the votes, there are concessions that have to be made. And Hakeem has been an amazing negotiator, and I can't wait to call him Speaker Jeffries. Speaking of the current speaker, Mike mm -hmm. Johnson. Yeah. Someone you know well, someone you serve <laughs> alongside, Marjorie Taylor Greene, has this on again, off again, perpetual threat, which I think keeps her in the headlines, if nothing else, bid to issue or vote on a motion to vacate. Will Democrats support Speaker Johnson to keep him in position? I, you know, there was a statement that was put out. I can only tell you what Jasmine Felicia Crockett is going to do. I will not be supporting Mike Johnson. Listen, my job and what my district sent me here to do was to govern. And the fact that essentially the only reason that we govern when we do is when there's a gun to the speaker's head is a problem for me. If this was someone that I felt like was an honest broker, you know, we just had um, so many retirements, but one of them was Kim Buck. Mm -hmm. And for Kim Buck to be a Freedom Caucus member to say that I get more done when the Democrats are in control, that tells you how out of control this Republican majority is. And I don't think that the American people should reward them by sending them back because it's only hurting us as Americans. So for me, I'm not going to vote for you because you finally pass aid months and months later to the extent that we know that Ukraine was harmed by the lack of ability to move forward on what we've always done. We've always supported our friends and we've always supported our allies. It's just what we do as Americans. I don't think that that's enough when you, number one, are an election denier who was basically trying to covert um, and subvert the vote of the and the will of the people. I'm not going to reward that. As a civil rights lawyer, as a black woman, I'm not voting for him. Now, if other people decide that they want to save him, that's their business and they can answer to, the, to their constituency. But it's not my job to pick or support the Republican Speaker of the House. And it's not a caucus position that you do that. The leader has made it clear that individual Democrats can do whatever they want on this. Absolutely. What's the conversation like? I don't think there's a lot of conversation. The thing is, we had all of these uh, independent members that decided that they were going to be independent and potentially very cheap dates. Um, you know, by the time you decide that you're going to do something this extreme, you should be able to um, elicit blood. Uh, out of the speaker. It's what we see happening with Marjorie. This is how we started this conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, she has not privileged a motion, which means that it's not become ripe, um, so to speak. And so instead, what she's been doing is she's been engaging in conversations with the speaker because what is she doing? She's eliciting blood. I mean, that's what it takes to um, really earn the support of different members. But you shouldn't have to do that with your own side. That should be... Uh, a, something that is the subject of negotiation for maybe the opposite party, not the same party, which lets you know that right now the Republican Party is in a crisis. They are imploding. Um, they are not one. They are uh, a party that has been hijacked by MAGA. And MAGA doesn't believe in governance. They believe in tearing things down, which is really wild because we have insurrectionists right now that are running to become members of Congress. 
These are people that were trying to tear our institution apart from the outside. Now they're trying to join us on the inside and tear it apart from within. That is what MAGA does versus Republicans. Traditional Republicans were just conservative. They looked at policy differently, but they believed in getting things done. Even if I disagreed with their agenda, they had one. Right now, the only agenda with MAGA is tearing us apart. On this word you used, implosion, a moment ago. So Marjorie Taylor Greene is pressing forward, is negotiating, but still holds out this threat, even though the former president has told her, don't do this. Yeah. What does that tell you? And how do you size up Marjorie Taylor Greene? You know, I, I feel like, first of all, you can't trust anything that Donald Trump says. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know what their behind the scenes conversations look like. I mean, this could be a good cop, bad cop situation. As somebody who's done criminal defense work, I've seen it before. Um, so let me, because we win no matter what we do, right? Mm. You've got Marjorie who's being the bad cop. You've got Trump who's being the good cop. And that way, MAGA world wins no matter which way this kind of goes. Trump gets to say if it ends up evolving into another chaotic kind of three, four weeks or indefinite amount of time before we get another speaker, or if we get one that Mag isn't MAGA approved, right? Then Trump gets to say, I told her not to do it. But then Marjorie, she's not affected by this because unfortunately, this is a solidly red gerrymandered district that's been gerrymandered to her favor. I just recently found out that a bunch of black folk in Cobb County were in her district. I had no idea. You would never believe that Marjorie Taylor Greene represented those folk. And she obviously never did speak for them. And of course, in this last iteration of a map, she definitely wanted them gone and wanted them out of her mm -hmm. district. Um, but this is the problem when we have gerrymandering. We end up with um, people that are so extreme that we can't get rid of them. Um, and Marjorie is definitely the definition of extreme in this house. And talk to me about the incentive structures for individual house members like Marjorie Taylor Greene, where a substantial amount of her fundraising isn't even from her district. It's from others Correct. who are MAGA aligned, MAGA Correct. supportive across the country who look at her as a kind of savior. Yeah, and what's so What are the wild, incentive structures there? I mean, the, the problem is exactly what you've stated. Like, it's a matter of you have really a minority of a minority. It feels like MAGA's so big because MAGA's so loud. They're like a megaphone, they're like a megaphone, like they're loud, but they are not the majority. They are a minority of minority, which is exactly the role that they play in the house. They are a minority within what is a very slim majority. Um, and she does have a lot of support when you look at it nationwide. But overall, when we get our polling, she polls the worst in the country the worst. So this is a minority of a minority, but they will put their $5 together mm -hmm. to support her. And it's the same thing that we see with Trump. Like Trump doesn't do well with his fundraising. Like, I mean, Biden has been crushing him regardless of the numbers. When we look at the polling and people say, oh, they both have the worst poll numbers of, you know, any two candidates that have ever run for the presidency. This is the rematch. Nobody wants to see all of that drama. The reality is that when we look at who is putting their money behind who, it's President Biden. And only recently did we see a bit of an insurgence of cash um, for Trump when finally they gave up on Nikki Haley. They gave up on mm -hmm. DeSantis. And it's the rich folk that are like, OK, at least we're going to get our tax breaks with him. So let's go ahead and put our money behind him. But for the most part, he was surviving off of MAGA. And MAGA wasn't enough. They did not have enough money to really be able to be in um, this very expensive presidential race with President Biden. Coming to you from what is colloquially referred to as the freshman dorm of the Longworth <laughs> House office building, that means fifth or sixth floor or higher. <laughs> we are with Jasmine Crockett, freshman member of Congress, Democrat, Texas District 30, back for segment two of The Takeout in just one moment. Florida is tough. You know, I've, I, you know, ever since the hanging chads, I've had a problem with Florida. <laughs> Welcome back to the takeout. So what is it like here in the freshman dorm? <laughs> Meaning the um, offices are small. You're kind of high up. Yeah. Uh, I have a beautiful view of nothing. Of nothing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it was funny because when my staff, because I let my staff pick the office, I was like, I don't care. 
Um, and I had nine people that I had to beat in my primary to get here and four people to beat in my general to get here. And some of my staff was like, oh, this is terrible. And I was like, listen, it's better than the office that my opponents got. Right. Because they didn't get one, you know. Um, so, you know, truly thankful to be here. And we honestly don't spend that much time in our offices. Mm -hmm. um, we're usually in committee or we're usually on the floor um, or we're usually fundraising off campus. Mm -hmm. Like we're usually not here mm -hmm. very often. So it's more so so that my staff can be comfortable, which is why I allow them to pick the office, but with all the retirements, the historic number of retirements coming, that means that my seniority moves up. And so uh, I'm sure they're looking forward to moving up like George and Wheezy. Yes. Um, <laughs> and getting to a deluxe days. apartment. <laughs> That's right, to a deluxe in apartment high. in the sky. That's right. <laughs> Any doubt in your mind Democrats will be the majority in the House of Representatives after this election? No, not at all. Um, How big will the majority be? Uh, I think it'll be slim. I think it'll be a slim majority. I think that five we, to 10? Yeah. Five to ten. I think seats? we're lucky if we get five to ten. Okay. Um, it's not that close. Yeah, I think it's going to be a very close election. A couple of things. Number one, again, we know that uh, all of the polling shows that there's a lack of excitement, specifically for the top of the ticket, which is something that we historically have not necessarily had to deal with. We usually rely on the top of the ticket to kind of drag mm -hmm. everybody in. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a different election, but I think that. Um, Democrats have consistently been um, um, underestimated, right? Because when we think about the midterms, they said, oh, Biden's polling numbers are so terrible. And when you have a president who has terrible polling numbers, that usually is reflective in the midterms. And then there's this wipeout. And so we're expecting this red wave. Plus, we had redistricting where we had crazy states like mm -hmm. the one I came from, the state of Texas, that wanted to play games and do very bad things with gerrymandering. Um, and this was the first time that they were able to go through redistricting without any real protections as it relates to um, the uh, Voting Rights Act. So uh, we knew that certain states, specifically those southern states, were going to be off the chain, and they were. Um, but they ended up with a red dribble. They did not end up with a red wave. We also have seen um, just these surprise elections. In fact, we ended up with having um, Marie Guzencamp Perez, the first female mechanic to ever swear into Congress, who's in my class, who's a rock star, no one paid attention to her race. No right. one knew that she was on the radar. She wasn't on the radar. We know that Lauren Boebert almost got taken out by mm -hmm. um, um, Adam uh, Fritz, Fritz, um, almost got taken out by uh, him, and it was only a 500 vote margin. So, And then we've seen all these special elections. We've seen in Alabama more than a 20 point swing for that state house race, we've seen it in Florida with a mayoral race, with a state uh, house race. We've seen these races that no one has paid attention to, that no one anticipated. And I don't think that it's really been about the candidates. I think that this is going to be a different election cycle than we've ever seen. One where it's not so much about the popularity or how much I really love the candidates that are on the ballot, but it's more so about the issues. We see people being driven to the polls by the issues, and so that's why I'm looking forward to Arizona. So I'm hoping that we will have some great surprises out of Arizona. And New York, I think, really was like, wait a minute, we ended up sending the national embarrassment to Congress? Uh, like, New York, we've got to wake up. We've got to make sure that we show up. We see that every single special election that New York has conducted since we got rid of George Santos has resulted mm -hmm. in Democratic wins and big swings as well. Even our most recent um, special election that we just had, that was a safe Democratic seat. Nobody was really stressed about it. We thought that that was going to be fine. But he overperformed by almost 15 points. So we're seeing that there's this overperformance by Democrats mm -hmm. all over the country. And so I think that the issues are going to be what drive people to the polls. And I think that Democrats are winning on the issues every single day. There's a phrase that's being bandied around that goes like this. Democrats lose the polls but win the elections. <laughs> Lately, I, listen, I, like the last 18 months, I, they poll poorly, then they perform on election day. Yep. The behavior on election day or leading up to election day is different than it's being tracked by polls. I don't think polls are accounting for the real people. It's so funny because people used to say, who are they polling? They didn't. I never got a phone call, right? Um, that's what people used to say. But I think that there's some truth to it because now we have people that have never been engaged in politics that are saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you're you're telling me that like I don't have a right to decide what's gonna happen with my body. And even people that historically um, they may not have polled because they literally aren't participating, 
and really probably would never participate but for a personal story. Mm -hmm. Things like what's happening with abortion is becoming very personal. Everybody knows somebody that is struggling. When we look at the state of Texas, the state of Texas had uh, over 26,000 pregnancies that were the result of rape just in the last year. 26,000. That is an astounding number. It's a number that makes people say, do I know somebody? It's a number that makes moms say, I've had moms come up to me and say, you know what, we've always loved UT, Texas A&M, like the really big, amazing schools in Texas. They're like, we don't know if we want to send our daughters because there's always been a rape culture on campuses and the idea that something could happen to my daughter and she's stuck in this state that really has decided that With she's- no recourse or very little nothing. recourse. Nothing, second class citizen. So, you know, these are having real consequences. And do you think that is the new and un- underappreciated dynamic of this I election? Do. I do. I think that Does, Do you think samples, it makes places like Florida back on the map? With a six-week With a six-week abortion ban? I think Florida's Does it make North Carolina with the Republican nominee for governor more on the map? Does it, does it North bring- North Carolina, I think, is in play. We know that we've been able to win statewide in North Carolina. We know that North Carolina, for the most part, has been kind of a 50-50 state, even though they just jacked up the congressional map. Um, Florida is tough. You know, I've, I, you know, ever since the hanging chads, I've had a problem with Florida. Uh, but I will tell you that it's all about how we message certain things, right? I think the repro issue is going to be a huge issue. Knowing that you have to get to 60% with that ballot issue means that we've got to get extra, right? Um, but there are Republicans that are voting in every single one of these states for the abortion issues. When we look at Kansas, when we look at Ohio, Montana. When, you look at the, when you look at the exit polls, it's not just Democrats. There are Republicans that are voting for it too, but having the 60% threshold that they're shooting for, I think does give Democrats a better chance. But you know, a lot of times it comes down to overall organization. And a lot of these states, when you look at the local or the state Democratic parties, they are not organized and equipped to really do what they need to do. And it looks at what type of investments are going to be made in these places. We can't win with abortion alone, but it is gonna be helpful that Florida also has marijuana. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be helpful um, that that's on the ballot. But this will take a lot of work on the ground, talking about things such as um, those that are struggling financially. We hear from people all the time about the cost of food. Well, we're fighting right now. We don't have a new farm bill, which we were supposed to do last year, and we did a year extension for. And right now, Republicans are consistently saying, we want to cut $30 billion in SNAP benefits when people only receive $6 a day to eat anyway. And people are astounded when I say that. And I say, you tell me what type of meals you get for $6 a day. You can't. And the fact that one side is saying, you know what, we want to even cut that down even mm -hmm. more is crazy. So when people say, financially, I was doing better, mm, let me tell you what they're trying to do. Like, it, it, yeah, before the pandemic, we all were doing better in the entire world, right? Mm -hmm. But it was a global pandemic that affected us globally, that caused for global inflation, that caused for our global supply chains to be affected. And if there's one country that has recovered better than everybody else, it's the United States. Now, just because we recovered better than everybody else doesn't mean that we are now pre-pandemic lifestyles. We're not. And I don't necessarily anticipate that we're going to get back there. But we have a president that understands that, number one, he doesn't control the Fed. I know people would love it if he did, but he doesn't control the Fed. And when people are saying, I can't afford to buy a home, the interest rates are too high. We have a president that is hearing you, but he needs a full team. Right now, we have this dysfunctional house, and he's saying, you know what? I want to give you $400 a month to help to defray the cost of the high interest rates. I want to do this for you. But I need people to understand that the president isn't a king. Mm -hmm. He can't do it by himself, and he's got to make sure that he's got the right team. So we've got to get our trifecta back, because when we had it in the last term, that is when we were able to make monumental change. The voice of Jasmine Crockett, Congresswoman, Texas 30. Back for segment three, the takeout, in just one second. I have people right now that constantly go on social media and say, we're not a democracy. That's what they say. They don't believe that we're a democracy.
Welcome back to The Takeout. Jasmine Crockett is with us. You mentioned George Santos in the last segment. <laughs> yes. He was voted out. He was. Henry Cuellar, a colleague of yours from the yes. Texas delegation, has been indicted. Yes. Serious charges. Yes. Should he resign? No. Why? You should know, he be ousted? No. 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 Should not resign and he should not be ousted. Well, let me tell you this. At this point in time, based on the information I have, my answer is no. Um, I need people to understand, number one, I'm a criminal defense attorney. Um, so I believe in the presumption of innocence. Um, things were a little different with George Santos for a couple of reasons. Number one, when we look at uh, Henry, if people will recall, his home was raided right before his primary two years ago. Mm -hmm. The voters were aware that his home was raided two years ago by the feds. He ended up winning that primary. He then went on to win that general with people knowing that this happened. When we start talking about George Santos, the question was, how much did the people know? The people didn't know very much about him because he lied about everything. We're not talking about someone who has misrepresented who he is. Now, whether or not um, he is found guilty of these crimes, I believe in allowing the system to work its way through. But there's definitely distinct differences in addition to the fact that Santos was not expelled until there was an ethics investigation that was conducted by the House. So the House did their own investigation into the allegations because there were so many things that were specifically tied into FEC and, and ethics things that have to do with him being in the House, especially with allegations of inappropriate things that he was doing with staff, all kinds of things, like House things. And when the House came together and unanimously, the entire House committee was basically recommending this guy has to go based on their independent mm -hmm. investigation. He had his opportunity at due process. He had an opportunity to defend against that. He decided not to participate. And based on what had been collected, that was ultimately when he was kicked out. This is a lot different for Henry. Number one, Henry maintains his innocence. Number two, I'm not going to talk about gold bars, but there weren't any gold bars in this situation. <laughs> and number three, um, Henry specifically says, hey, I asked for an ethics opinion on this issue. Supposedly, he got an ethics opinion on it. And until we have an ethics investigation, if there's an ethics investigation, and if for some reason it looks a little different mm -hmm. right now, just on an indictment, absolutely not. Since you mentioned gold bars, they are implicated <laughs> in a case involving a senator, Robert Menendez. It's a different I chamber. It was funny. Should he resign? I don't think so. I still have the same opinion. Right. I just described Presumption myself. of innocence. Presumption of innocence. And I don't know that Senate ethics has taken up that issue either. Um, and, and especially with Menendez, I think it's not appropriate for him to resign because this isn't the first time that the senator has been accused of wrongdoing and he was acquitted. Well, no, he wasn't acquitted. He wasn't found guilty. He was not found guilty. <laughs> he was not found right. guilty. Right. Uh, let, me, let me clarify that. Um, and so this is someone who went through the process before and a jury of his peers was unable to, reach to determine. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think that it puts him in a position to say, listen, if I would have left, I would have left for nothing because I told you that I wasn't guilty and I wasn't found guilty. Right. Um, when former President Trump says the reason Henry Cuellar was indicted was because Biden didn't like his position on immigration, what do you say? <laughs> I don't know why people listen to this guy. He's a joke. <laughs> That's, you know, I don't, I can't say why uh, Henry was indicted. I know nothing about this investigation whatsoever. And so I won't pretend to act as if I do because as a practicing or formerly practicing lawyer, um, that would be problematic for me to do that. I will tell you that the criminal justice system very rarely decides to do things based upon political positions. I think what people should hear from that statement is that that is how the former president perceives the role of the DOJ and they should be concerned because the DOJ should not go after people because of political positions or politics at all. They should follow evidence, and then that evidence should lead them towards seeking justice. That is what the DOJ is supposed to do, and it's problematic that someone who served as the president is still confused about how the DOJ works. Did you read the Time Magazine interview of former President Trump? I did not. 
In it, he was asked if he were president again and a U.S. attorney did not prosecute someone he wanted to be prosecuted, would he fire that U.S. attorney? I know the answer. What's the answer? Yes, of course. What does that tell you? That tells you that he doesn't believe in the rule of law, but we know that, right? And he also doesn't believe in the independence that is supposed to be um, garnered by the various branches of government. Like, we need to send him back to elementary school <laughs> and understand um, what we are supposed to do. It also shows you that he doesn't believe in democracy. And I think that that's the alarm that Democrats have been trying to ring over and over and over, um, especially as we sit here and the Supreme Court is deciding whether or not he should just have carte blanche immunity as it relates to committing crimes. I mean, it is... So let's just take the last two minutes of what you said. Why is this race still tied? If he's a threat to democracy, he doesn't believe in the rule of law, he's a joke and he wants absolute carte blanche to commit any crime he wants as president. Why is this race still tied? I think it's still tied because there are culture wars that have arisen um, mostly at the prompting of the other side and has convinced people that, you know, we're going to take their guns or we're going to take their girls' sports or, um, you know, we as people of color are going to take all their jobs and be unqualified and they're going to be broke. Like, there is this wedge and division that has been driven in this country that has made people that are, in my opinion, simply unaware and uneducated on how our systems work and how they're supposed to work. I have people right now that constantly go on social media and say, we're not a democracy. That's what they say. They don't believe that we're a democracy. They don't believe in democracy. They don't understand it. And when you have schools that are taking things like history um, and civics out of the classroom, this is what we get. It's a bunch of people that have no idea about the foundation that we were founded on. They have no idea of what real freedom looks like. Freedom for them is white folk can do whatever they want to and everybody else, listen, it's okay if y'all go back to the plantation. That is a problem, like not understanding these things. I had somebody jump in my inbox the other day and wanted to tell me about, of course it was a non-black person, and wanted to tell me about slavery and why I should be happy that my ancestors were brought over here because they had a better life. That is what she wanted to tell me because she wanted to talk to me about the fact that black folk were slaves in Africa as well. Like, I don't know that, but the fact that you think that it's okay to justify slavery anyway, let me find your people and put them in some chains today. Mm -hmm. And you tell me how great that is. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's insane. It's insane the things that they've convicted convince themselves of. Let me talk to you about immigration for a second. 15 of your colleagues have urged President Biden to take executive action. Do you think he should? To you know, tighten border restrictions, to do things to address not only a polling problem, which is evident to everyone, but also a numerical and security problem. You know, I, I don't think that you should ever govern specifically based on, I don't think you should have poll driven governance. I think that you should have results driven governance. And the thing that we're dealing with right now is number one, most people have no idea about how immigration works. If you go and talk to the average American and you ask them, well, who's illegal? What does it mean to be a quote unquote illegal, right? Like they don't know. They're just like, oh, it's anybody that's crossing the border. And that's not true. They don't know what our wait times look like. They don't know about the case managers. They don't know. What refugee status is or isn't. They have, they have no idea. They don't know what asylum is. They don't understand any of this. They don't understand that we have people that come over and they work on our farms and they go back. They have these seasonal, like they don't know any of this. And I will tell you, I'm not necessarily mad that people don't because our immigration system is complicated and it's convoluted. But to think that with a swipe of a pen, you somehow stop the influx is, it's elementary thinking. And I don't really like people that play politics. So basically say, hey, I signed this executive order, guys. It's gonna fix everything just so that you can play with people. And then when it's not fixed, people are upset because you lied to them. So I understand that immigration is so very complicated. It's like everybody now wants to talk about what's happening in Haiti, 
But I remember when the Haitians were trying to come into Texas and our governor had law enforcement on horseback beating them in the water and beating them back. I remember those images and no one asked, why are the Haitians at the Texas border? The question is why? Why are people needing to come to our country? It ain't because it's so great. Clearly, we got a former president that's on trial and running for re-election. I mean, we are going wild right now, right? But what's happening is that people didn't understand that the Haitian president had just been killed. Right. They didn't understand that there had been a destabilization. And this is what we're seeing all over. And it's because of the prior administration failing to do the investments that we historically have done around this world to help stabilize governments and provide economic opportunities that keep them where they are instead of coming over here. Voice of Jasmine Crockett, segment, segment four of The Takeout in just one second. People need to separate the Israeli people from Netanyahu, just like they need to separate the Palestinian people from Hamas. Back with Jasmine Crockett. Thanks for hanging out with us at the takeout. So we're going to save the easiest issue for last. Awesome. <laughs> Isra Israel and Gaza. Oh, yeah. So easy. And campus protests, which now many of your House Republican colleagues call pro-Hamas protests that should be eradicated on college campuses. Let's start with that. Your reaction. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, here's the deal. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to make this very clear. Um, it has been frustrating for me to, as a, a member of leadership, I'm the freshman leadership representative, and so my colleagues, my freshman colleagues come and they share their stories with me. And actually, I had one that was near tears this morning telling me about a protest that's going to take place at her home. And this is a Democratic colleague, and it has been so frustrating that my... Don't be alarmed, ladies and gentlemen. That's a regular vote call. <laughs> it is. That's what it sounds um, like. It's okay. I, I've been so hurt because the only people that are being protested are Democrats. But the way that the Democrats, on average, I'm not going to say everybody, but on average, view this war is like this. We have Hamas that is a terrorist organization. We do not equate Palestinians or anybody that's in Gaza as Hamas. We separate them. Mm -hmm. We also have the Israeli people and we have Netanyahu and his government. And as far as I'm concerned, Netanyahu is uh, a, a more intelligent version of Trump. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he was facing a lot of the same situations that Trump is facing. Netanyahu prior to this war was being protested because he was trying to reform the courts. We've had some sort of reformation of reformation of our courts because of Trump. Um, and he, along with different cabinet members, um, have their own investigations that are taking place mm -hmm. and charges that are pinning against them. And so I think that people need to separate the Israeli people from Netanyahu, just like they need to separate the Palestinian people from Hamas. And what's being lost in this entire fight is that we all care, as far as I'm concerned, all Democrats. I don't think I have talked to one colleague that can say that they don't care about the Israeli people or the Palestinian people. But when we start talking about the Republicans, the Republicans do not care. In fact, we were just... Um, do not care about what? Do not care about the Palestinian people. The civilians. They do not. They do not. In fact, they equate the Palestinian people to being terrorist, to being Hamas. Um, and we're talking about, you know, there's been an extraordinary amount of children that have been, even children. This is their view of children. And, you know, there is a certain member out of Michigan that said, nuke them all. Like, this is the type of rhetoric that we're getting out of the Republican side. But for some reason, it's the Democrats that are actually being protested. Most people don't know that there were three packages for Israel that came on this floor. The first package was for Israel and to defund the IRS. Republicans carried that bill. The second package was just to give money to Israel. Republicans carried that bill. 
Democrats in the Senate, they're the ones that never brought those bills up. The only way that there was going to be a package was if there was also something for the people of Gaza if Democrats were going to give support to it. But ultimately, if this was a Republican-controlled House, a Republican-controlled Senate, and a Republican president known as Trump, the guy that had the Muslim ban, the guy that wants to reinstitute the Muslim ban, let me tell you, they don't care about the people of Gaza. And to me, it is the most inhumane thing if you can look at this situation and not be able to separate the people from the war itself and talk about the fact that we care that there is suffering, period, for the people. We care about what happened on October 7th. We care about the um, hostages that are still over in Gaza. We care about the fact that there are innocent Palestinians that have lost their lives. And frankly, Democrats have never been big on war. Mm -hmm, right? We have never been big on war. Have the campus protests bled into anti-Semitism from your vantage point? I think, I will tell you this. I think that there are certain things that allow for hate to rise to the top. Meaning that I think Trump in general, in fact, we have the numbers. Once Trump came into office after that, the rise in hate overall, whether it was Asian hate, if you remember, there was this huge rise in Asian hate, whether it was Islamophobia, remember, it all came when he did the Muslim ban, all those things. Um, and so it's not that I don't think that the hate didn't exist. It's just that they had somebody that said, go ahead and take your hoods off. That's the difference. And so I don't believe that you ended up in a situation where people didn't already have whatever feelings they had. I think that they have been emboldened to say whatever those feelings are. Um, and honestly, you know, it's almost like anything else. You're seeing the most dramatic portions of the campus protest. And that's what, you know, that's newsworthy, right? But How, that's not every single campus protest. Understood. How nervous are you about the political implications of the campus protests, of them manifesting in Chicago at the convention, of becoming a drag in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, elsewhere? You know, I, I'm concerned about Michigan. I am very concerned about Michigan uh, for a, a lot of complicated reasons. Uh, Michigan is a huge concern for me. Overall, you know, when, when we do look at the polling, the war is not polling super high. To be honest, Americans have never voted based on foreign policy. I mean, they vote based on their personal situation, their personal lives. Um, and so it's not polling super high, but I will tell you because of the demographics in Michigan and because the numbers have always been really tight in Michigan, I am concerned. Um, and so we've got a lot of work to do. And I think that overall, um, you know, the quicker we can get to a ceasefire, the better. Um, but How satisfied are you with the president's handling of this? I'm fine with the president's handling of it. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I think that, you know, the average person believes we should be telegraphing um, foreign policy. We've never telegraphed foreign policy. Um, that could be an international security issue. Like, we don't telegraph what goes on. And because I'm on this side of it, I already knew that the behind the scenes conversations that the president was going to have with Netanyahu probably sounded a little differently than what you would see out front in front of cameras, but the average person doesn't know that, right? Um, and so I always felt that. But even here recently, uh, myself and a number of colleagues sent a letter out just asking that even though the aid package had been passed and a number of us had voted for it, we asked that the president not release weapons if Israel was going into Rafah. And as of right now, it looks like that's where he's going with it. Um, so overall, I think it's just a delicate balance. I think he's done uh, the best that he can. Um, and I definitely think it would be so much worse if the other guy was in office. The voice of Jasmine Crockett, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your time. Stay tuned for your takeout outtake especial. That is next. I'm a Texan, so Beyonce is always going to be in the rotation. <laughs>
Welcome to your takeout outtake especial. Jasmine Crockett is our guest this week. Congresswoman, we have three questions we ask everyone on this show. We've been doing this show now in our eighth year, I'm proud to say. Eight Yay. years, can you believe it? Here are the three questions. Take them in whichever order you prefer. Most influential book in your life and why? All-time favorite movie? And if you're going to be on a long flight or a long drive and really, really enjoy some music, what artist or genre is that most likely to be? Okay, I'm starting with artist. Um, hmm. You know, I've been... <laughs> the rap battle has got me a little twisted right now, you know? I just feel like... You're not like, alone, you're not alone. You know, I just feel like I need to, like, listen some more Kendrick. Um, in fact, that's what I've been doing is, like, listening some more Kendrick. So, um, I think right now I probably would be listening to uh, a lot more Kendrick Lamar. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm a Texan, so Beyonce is always going to be in the rotation. Do you like the country album? Um, I do. I do. Um, is it not my is favorite. It, is it country enough? Or is it like, there's this whole thing about, is it country oh, or what's country? We are not going there. <laughs> we are not going there. Um, but no, it is country. Gotcha. <laughs> um, Fact. Verified. And then I would say, uh, as far as a book, um, it has to be hmm, the audacity of hope. Hmm? It, it has to be that author um, Barack Obama. That's right. Um, and you know, not dreams from my father, but uh, yeah, audacity of hope. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, number two. And and the thing is, I I read that book a number of times before I officially did certain things, and it it's it's just truly an inspiration. Like who he is and his story is just inspirational. In and of itself. So, um, okay, movie. Movie is going to be either set it off, <laughs> <laughs> or um, the Titanic. The Titanic. Okay, Titanic. Okay. Two completely different ways, but yeah. <laughs> Tell my audience about set it off if they don't know. Okay, so uh, Jada Pinkett Smith. Queen Latifah, um, but it's basically for black women that are struggling to make it, and um, they decide to turn to Robin Banks. Um, one of the young ladies worked at a bank, and literally they were in the hood. And um, for me, it's just one of those movies that kind of epitomizes a lot of the work that I've done um, as a former public defender. Because there are people that think that if you go to jail, it's because you're an evil person. And there are some evil people. I will say that for sure. But so many of the people that I've come across, um, they really were more so a victim of circumstances. And it's why I push so hard for economic opportunities. Because I truly believe that we can decrease crime and, and better lives um, if we just give people a shot. And that movie's a window into that. That movie is a window into Jasmine that. Jasmine Crockett, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Absolutely. We'll see you next week, folks.